Welcome back to another episode of Large Learning. Today we have a true pioneer in the realm of educational computing and technology, Dr. Gary Steger. With a career spanning decades, Dr. Steger has been at the forefront of integrating technology into the classroom, challenging the status quo, and advocating for progressive pedagogy. As we all grapple with the implications of AI and technology in the classroom, who better to guide us and sometimes bring us back down to earth than someone who's been shaping it. So without further ado, let's dive into this wonderful long conversation with Dr. Gary Steger. We're in for an absolute treat uh, for the next hour or so, because with us joining the show, we have Dr. Gary Steger. So welcome, Gary. It's great to be with you. It's good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Gary, uh, for those who don't know, has been um, changing the hearts and minds of educators around the world for probably the last 30 to 40 years, if not longer. Uh, He has been a pioneer in educational computing, has led the introduction and implementation of some of the world's first one-to-one Uh, laptop programs in schools, uh, one of which was actually here in Victoria. Um, And I think for me, Gary's, uh, the highlight of Gary's work is the confidence he gives people to really transcend the status quo and to think bigger about what's possible uh, in the best interest of kids. And he's the author of Invent to Learn. Uh, he has spoken at probably thousands of conferences around the world, Gary, <laughs> uh, and probably run tens of thousands of workshops. And um, Gary has had a, a, a real influence on my own career from a personal level. And as a young teacher, I really um, was drawn to the, to the work that he does um, around having students be agents over the technologies at their disposal and be the creators of tomorrow's technology today. So... Um, Without further ado, we're going to just jump straight in. And, and Gary, you know, given given your long history in, in education, um, the work that you've been doing over many, many years across sectors around the world, did you want to start perhaps by giving us your current assessment on the state of education today? Well, I'll, I'll start with a positive first. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to say to you how much I enjoyed being at Westbourne a couple months ago and I was genuinely moved nearly to tears by the joy and excitement and hard fun that your teachers were engaged in um, during our workshop. And we weren't doing anything particularly novel or new that, that we need to make a distinction between old and timeless. And and I'm trying to focus on, on timeless um, activities and, and – really believe that what Piaget taught us is true, that knowledge is a consequence of experience, that there's no substitute for experience, um, and that our, it's our obligation as educators to introduce children to things they don't yet know they love. You know, I want to I live in a world where kids wake up in the middle of the night with a burning desire to get back to work, to school to continue working on something that matters to them, and where their teachers wake up every morning and ask themselves, how do I make this the best seven hours of a kid's life? Um, so having said that, I think we're in a, a period of turmoil. Um, I think COVID-19 um, was a mass suicide event for a lot of schools. And, and a lot of the backlash to schooling that we're seeing around the world from book bans um, to all kinds of hysteria over curriculum is a manifestation of Um, The open kimono moment, which was parents got a gut full. They got a good look at what schooling was, and they were unimpressed. And and I think there were two periods um, during the COVID um, crisis that are are worth um, differentiating. There was the first few months, maybe from March to about June, where folks like yourself said, take care of one another, look out for each other don't get sick, don't die, we'll let the curriculum go. Um, Let's see if we can find some way to build community and focus on what matters. And that was really quite lovely. And I I think that was kind of the best moment that I'd seen in schooling in quite some time. And I remember around the same time advising my colleagues in the United States who were going into their summer holidays, don't go to any meetings this summer, real or virtual. Nothing good can come of them. Just take care of yourself. And boy, was I underestimating what would get cooked up during that summer. 
Um, and it was the worst forms of instruction imaginable. Bitmoji classrooms to enforcing ho- uniform policies online to, you know, inventing nonsense like hybrid instruction. Um, I, I can't imagine how many people are getting a PhD now in hybrid instruction, which instead of applying some common sense and recognizing, hey, Adrian, you have some students who are coming to school and you have some that are remote. So what we'll do is you take the ones who are coming to school. I'll teach the ones remotely. Now what we'll do is we'll prop an iPad up on the chair in the back of the room and broadcast to the kids what's happening in the cubicles you know, on campus. And it was just, this, it was just a disaster. Um, and and I think I think it did a lot of uh, an awful lot of damage. And then um, now we're blaming the screens for our for our fa- our failures. I have a slide that I've been using in keynotes uh, of Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, and it says, "I speak for the screens, for the screens have no tongues." Um, <laughs> there's always been a profound difference between the way that I propose using computers as intellectual laboratories and vehicles for self-expression to create opportunities to learn and do and express oneself in ways that were unimaginable before. And the way that a parent might use an iPad to shut a kid up in a Macca's. Um, and one is passive and consumptive and one is creative and, and, and intellectually deep and rich. Um, and, and so we haven't been able to differentiate between those two uses in a lot of school contexts. Um, and, and COVID made it worse. And then ironically, um, over last Christmas holidays, education was revolutionized by chat GPT and nothing will ever be the same. And now the very same people who were, um, horrified at this damage by the damage screens were doing to us, um, have either amplified that, that hysteria or have gone completely the opposite direction and are now viewing that as a panacea. Um, and it's still consumptive and it's still sort of low hanging fruit. And, um, when, when I, when I log into LinkedIn, I feel like a 13 year old girl on Instagram. I want to cut myself the literally hundreds of instant AI and education experts selling handfuls of magic beans to gullible schools. Um, scares and troubles me a great deal. Having, having having followed your work for a long time, Gary, I, I know that there were similar frustrations for you and for and for many others. Um, you know, fifteen years ago, when uh, conference programs at international technology conferences were abuzz with um, workshops on how to effectively use Twitter or social networking. Mm-hmm. Or, and do you draw an analogy to, to what we're seeing now with, with something like ChatGPT and the seemingly explosion or proliferation of expertise that have come out of the woodwork? Well, well sure. There's sort of an unmoored fad du jour. I mean, I, 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 see, I see schools that are competitors to yours that literally have a new pedagogical philosophy daily um, or, or they're – you know these people with hilarious titles like, um, you know, director of future, or you know, assistant deputy head of digital. I mean, that like that's not even a noun. It's it, it's like being the director of red in a school or something. It's it's just it's it's preposterous. And and I guess in order to justify those positions, you have to talk about a lot of different things all the time and keep your lips moving. And, and there's an overemphasis on talking versus doing. And, uh, you know, some of the concern you expressed is rooted in, you know, I actually heard of all people, Bill Clinton say this at an education conference in the U.S. once. Uh, President Clinton said that every problem in education has been solved somewhere before. Um, and yet we suffer from this collective amnesia where we're continuously – Read, we're continuously discovering that which already exists each time with diminished expectations. So there's not only people chasing fads, but there's a, but, but it's accompanied by an idea aversion and an unwillingness to actually um, change things. I mean, I'll tell you, I got interested in educational technology, educational computing 40 years ago because that's where the wisest, most radical committed educators were. Um, and I sadly no longer find that to be the case. I think it's um, 
It's interesting times, and I'm finding tension even in my own role now, Gary, um, you know, as a, as a believer in uh, constructionist or constructivist approaches to education, learning by doing, um, having agency over the technologies at your disposal. And sometimes the best way to understand a technology is to, is to understand it from the inside out. So, you know, instead of just using a 3D printer, why don't you build one? Uh, the same could be said around you know computers and yet in schools uh these days we we lock down computers uh so that students don't even have administrator rights over their own machine um oh well, that, well they, i mean that, i mean yeah, that, that, yeah. well uh, yeah i mean it, i've been you know we have a mutual friend who was in charge of educational technology for the state where you live um and i would walk with her into classrooms where people would say no we have to do that and she would say, no, you don't. And they would say, yes, we do. And she would say, no, I'm in charge. And they would say, yes, but we have to. Um, so it's either, a, it's either some sort of pathology or, or it's a defense mechanism to resist, to resist you know, change. Um, mm. you know, for the people who are talking about chat GPT training and teachers require PD, I, I honestly don't know what you would do after seven minutes. Um, you know, it's like, you know, if read, read Postman and Weingartner's teaching us a subversive activity, you know, everyone needs a highly tuned crap detector. Um, you know, we want to teach, you know, we don't need digital literacy or digital citizenship or digital learning. We need learning and citizenship and literacy. And if we were covering that, then, then all these sort of, <laughs> newfangled adjectives applied to it wouldn't, wouldn't be quite so necessary. Um, you know, if, you, if you've actually used ChatGPT for a few minutes, um, you marvel at some things, but you quickly um, realize that there's nothing to be terribly afraid of. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and, yet, and yet it's funny that the people who are making the biggest splash talking about generative AI are talking about all the wondrous things it can do to sustain highly questionable educational practices hmm. or to make them a little less effort. Um, you know, things like lessons, lesson plans, assessment, marking, competition, ranking, sorting, a belief that education is a scarce resource. None of those um, notions gets challenged. I would like to challenge all of them, any of them. Um, I, you know, the, just the fundamental notion of a lesson the idea that you've prepared some beginning, middle, and end that has no room for serendipity, where there's going to be a right answer, where there's going to be a mutually agreed upon conclusion, um, where there's going to be no surprise, where there's going to be no magic or beauty or serendipity, um, connections to other disciplines, to other subject areas, domains of knowledge um, that might take a little less time or a little bit more time. I, I find all of that objectionable. Um, so why would we be burdening teachers with working inside those constraints in the first place and then why would we be uh, you know applying a new layer of technology that could be used to to create all kinds of new wondrous opportunities for for the construction of knowledge um to reinforce drudgery and questionable practices in the first place you know edu education reform has to be about subtraction as much as as addition we need to engage in some editing. We need to question some of this stuff. You know, you see these numbers. You know, teachers in Victoria spend 2,000 hours a year writing lesson plans. And first of all, the number is just laughable. Um, but it's preposterous. But second of all, okay, so they're spending a lot of time doing that. How come no one asks why are they spending all the time doing that? And maybe hmm. their time could be spent doing something more constructive, like becoming subject matter experts or getting good at a hobby, or getting to know their, their students. You know, one, one of the other most moving experiences I had in my last trip to Australia was hanging out at my favorite primary school in the whole world, Spensley Street Primary School, State School in Clifton Hill. And I was walking around the school with the new AP, and he not only, like you, he not only knew the name of every kid in the school, he knew who they barracked for. You know, and then he could hang shit on a second grader about, you know, Collingwood or something. Um, and <laughs> there was something, something really beautiful about that. That's what teaching is. Mm. Not, not marking, not lesson plans. It's about relationships. It, it's about 
creating memories. It's mm. about introducing children to things they don't yet know they love. Mm. Isn't yeah, well, great, I couldn't agree more, Gary. And I think, oh, sorry, uh, Kate. Oh, I, was yeah, just gonna, I was just going to say, um, I, I think there might be <laughs> just a tad <laughs> bit of lag there, Kate. You jump in. I'll go next. Okay. Are we uh, we we're connecting across the world? You know, it's back into in the nineties having a phone call. Sorry about that. Um, my question was just around that that sense of connection because it does echo the conversation that Adrian and I had with um, Tegan and Liam from from Westbourne around the tools that we have at our disposal now to that the great promise is to remove friction or remove baggage from. Uh, kind of day-to-day -day lives of teachers so that connection is possible. I mean, that's the great hope, but isn't that great hope of technology what has been for 20, 30 years? It's meant to give us more time to focus on the things that are important, but in a way it kind of snowballs into this thing that becomes another uh, aspect to the job and gets in the way of, of true connection. We're in a world that is digital, that is, you know, we're literally talking to each other um, through a computer now, how do you accept that reality plus uh, emphasize or make space for the personal in-person connection? Oh, it's, it's a big question. Um, you know, I said in our email when we were talking back and forth that um, the best work that I've done in my career was when I got to spend months working in a school and helping teachers and parents and administrators see through the eyes and the hands and the screens of their kids what was possible in order to create some models that they could then build upon. Um, and now we live in a world where it's not just a reality that I don't get to do that as often, um, but that if you've been to a conference lately, sessions are 20 minutes long and everything is a game show. And can you stand on the red dot? And can you quote McKinsey reports? And um, can, can you do, you know, and Ed, Ed schools, you know, there's nobody who hates education or schools more than schools of education. Um, you know, so, you know, colleges of education want, want to have nothing to do with teachers. Teachers are teaching. They want to talk about leadership. And there's no reward for being an excellent teacher in most systems. You have to get out of the classroom as quickly as possible. So we're just... We're distracted by all sorts of things and forces that really have very little to do with the technology. Um, you know, the, some people are excited about using computers for efficiency or to increase comprehension in things that we've always wanted to teach kids. Um, but what's always driven my work is the opportunity for kids to know and do in ways that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And so the the stuff that I've been playing with that's kind of adjacent to AI has, has been based on discovering that chat GPT couldn't solve a second grade arithmetic problem. And then knowing that I needed to fact check what it was giving me data wise and writing a program for doing so. And then always engaging in the same activity, which is how do I create a version of this that kids can participate in? And finding myself going back to 50-year-old logo projects where kids were playing with random sentence or poetry or haiku or gossip generating. Um, and then, you know, write a procedure that will take a word and give you the plural form of that word and start to build rule-based systems, intelligent systems for pluralizing a word. And when I started playing with these projects with year five kids in 2023 – in every single instance, within a couple of minutes, a kid would raise their hand or just spontaneously blurt out, hey, this is just like AI. And then we could start, how could we generate random words? How are we going to know which ones are English? Well, you need a large model. You need a database of stuff to check that against. You need a large language model. So that we're, we're gaining experience with the underlying technology and the ideas behind generative AI so that – we have agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world where we can build our own tools to, to fact check, where we can, we can get to the point that I find very few kids get to where they can use the computer so that the computer begins to work for them as opposed to them just communicating some ideas to the computer. One of the reasons why I think schools are so agitated by chat GPT is because it's really good at the, at the nonsense that schools value. Um, you know, you want to write a five-paragraph essay about a topic you don't care about, ChatGPT is really good at that. 
Um, I, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and, I, and and a scholar, you know, it was, it, I was at one of these conferences where there were people engaged in all kinds of academic cosplay, and and someone had a bunch of federal money to um, conduct serious research, and the research consisted of um, asking children what they wanted to use AI for. As if that's a valid question, because they're suddenly experts in something that no one can quite define. And one of the findings of this this study was the children don't want to, AI to write their papers, to write their reports. And and everyone, oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. bravo 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 kids. And I'm like, and I just thought to myself, why not? It, you know, if it can, it should. Um. You know, if if you ask ChatGPT to write a poem, you're immediately going to ask it to make the poem better, to make it less flowery, to use bigger words, to make it rhyme, to have couplets, to to turn it into a haiku, to you know, and um, and and that process of editing of is is actually an internal monologue. You're having a conversation with yourself. I think a kid engaged in that is is engaged in the work of being a poet probably more than they would have been without the technology. So if we think poetry is important, then then this is a way of being a poet by having the computer sort of mirror your own intellectual and creative processes. Um, but if, you know, aside from this sort of um, research by, you know, participatory bias of telling the, you know, telling some adult who's asking you, do you want to use ChatGPT to cheat? Oh, of course not. Oh, bravo, children. Um, you know, maybe maybe we ought to use it for things like that. And, and, and that's obviously the kinds of things that teachers are finding useful, that they're using it to do trivia that they shouldn't be engaged in in the first place. I would just like to move on from the trivia. Well, well much of your work, Gary, um, with teachers uh, in, in terms of your uh, summer institute constructing modern knowledge that you hold each year, is it, how long has that been running, Gary? Is that and now it's 12th, 13th year? 15th. 15th year. Um, uh, for one, I know uh, having, set, ha- having had some colleagues attend that institute over multiple days, the profound and transformative impact that had on their practice as teachers um, coming back and, and adopting uh, a mindset around uh, powerful ideas, um, students at the centre, agency, not having a prescriptive curriculum to follow, but having moments for serendipity and and um, doing things that they didn't think were possible even just a few days ago. Um, mm-hmm. Did you want to give a plug for your institute and perhaps um, tell our listeners or explain to our listeners um, how that how the institute works and what you're setting out to achieve through that work? Sure. Well, I'll give you a little bit of historical background. Um, I had the great privilege of spending 20 years or so working with Seymour Papert, the father of educational computing, the gentleman who helped Piaget understand how children construct mathematical knowledge. And um, Seymour, Seymour was a fierce critic of schools, but all of his research was in schools. Um, a lot of the critics of schools today don't go near the place. They're afraid. They, don't, they wouldn't know the first thing to do. Um, you know, if, if you looked at the crazy week that I spent in, in Melbourne recently, where I did everything from um, family workshops of prep to year six kids at 630 on a Tuesday school night um, after a day long workshop for maths teachers in Ballarat to, you know, I'd like to see any of the sort of TED talk kind of people do the range, engage in the kind of range of activities that I've been engaged in. And it's and it's all rooted in the kind of ex- experiences that I've had where. Um, there's, as I said before, knowledge is a consequence of experience. And Papert knew all of the great education reformers of his time. And any time one of them was asked about computing or about modernity in any form, they, they tended to say silly things. And I used to say to Seymour, can't we build a bridge between these two communities, the sort of progressive education reform community? And and those of us who, who view computers in a constructionist fashion so that they can see that we're on the same page, that we can supercharge and, and be pa- more powerful together. Supercharge these ideas and be pa- more powerful together. He was never able to pull it off. Um, and so I decided it had to happen. And in 2008, I created Constructing Modern Knowledge, which was a four-day institute where – 
we don't call it a conference because there's very little sitting and listening. It's the emphasis is on learning by doing. We ask teachers to take off their teacher hat and put on their learner hat. We have a mountain of materials. Last year, about 60 cases of stuff that we shipped cross country. Everything from plastic poop to an inflatable room that someone figured out a way to make breathe. Um, and we, we start with a ritual of asking folks, what do you want to make? And people come up with ideas and some of them are outrageous and outlandish. And we write them all down on butcher paper around the room. And then we ask people to grab pens and write their name under any project they're interested in. They can choose multiple projects. And that gives them a time to think about the, the projects and, and stew, marinate in them a little bit. And then we say, um, well, we've got, you know, like 200 project ideas and 100 people. And, and then people in their heads start saying, well, these sort of connect. And we don't spend any time worrying about that. But they start making those connections. And then I say, okay, what I want you to do is if, if you're hell-bent on working on a particular project idea, I want you to write it on a piece of paper and go out in the corridor and hold it above your head like Norma Ray. And if, if other people are interested in that project, they'll join you. If no one, is, no one joins you, um, you can either work alone or you can find some other project to work on or combine forces. And you're not a leader. You're just a beacon. You're just a buoy you know, for people to find. And then we say, go do it. And we have a fabulous faculty of, of educators, 99% of whom are CMK alumni. And we're to the point now where if I raise an eyebrow or point in a direction, they know exactly what to do. And they can get in and get out. They can provide just the seed that's necessary to generate the largest flower, the most beautiful garden, without, le- without distorting their process or the project that they're working on or making it their own. Um, I, f- I found myself recently in a workshop setting that when people would gesture for me to come over to help, as I was approaching them, I was actually walking backwards simultaneously um, because all they really need is a very quick dose of inspiration or sometimes a gesture. And, um, and then the experience is punctuated by conversations with um, – extraordinary human beings who have ha- who have led productive lives um, and it's only recently that I've even shared with my partner Sylvia Martinez um, my inspiration for the kinds of speakers that we have um, so there's four 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 days of uninterrupted project work where teachers are working by themselves or in teams of various sizes on on personally meaningful projects and we only interrupt their project work um, about once a day for a conversation with someone who's great at what they do. And I, I've only recently started disclosing that there is three sort of categories of person that I have as guest speakers. Um, and we've punched way above our weight. We've had a, a number of Grammy Award winners and Tony Award winners and Pulitzer Prize winners and four MacArthur geniuses. Um, and the categories are a great progressive educator who – who's someone whose shoulders we stand on and, and who are contemporary educators should, should know. And we like people to be able to leave CMK saying they spent time with someone rather than they heard someone. And nothing makes me happier or brings me greater satisfaction and joy than when I find out two, three years after the fact that some teacher from whoop whoop, you know, went for soup dumplings with Carlo Rinaldi or has been carrying on a correspondence with, with one of the guest speakers who came, who they never dreamed of having met. Um, the second category is someone who's doing something profoundly interesting with technology, was an innovator with educational technology. So we had the designers of the BBC Microbit year, for example. We've had people who are, you know, the creators of Logo and, um, and Mitchell, the creators of Scratch and the Makey Makey and folks like that. Um, and then the third category, I think, is the most provocative, and that's people who are great at things that your school guidance counselor didn't tell you was an option, um, who have had careers as treehouse designers and as 19-year-old experts on the history of Negro League baseball or um, a guy who, who was invited by UNESCO to paint Stonehenge with light or turn mountains purple um, – or this year we had 
Charlie Rosen, who's 32 years old and has two consecutive Tony Awards, has been nominated three consecutive years, and a Grammy Award for his orchestrations on Broadway. Um, but the thing that attracted me to him was that his side hustle, his hobby, is something called the 8-Bit Big Band, where he merges his his love of video games and video game music with orchestral music and big band jazz, and he has a 60-piece orchestra playing modern arrangements of video game music to rapturous audiences in concert halls across the United States. Um, and we had Casey Neistat, who basically invented vlogging and um, – you know, and people who worked with, Pia, you know, several people who worked with Piaget and, you know, and, and that's that. And it, I really think it's important for, for educators to know what greatness looks like um, so that they can create the context in which their kids can become good at something and then hopefully fall in love with it and someday be great at it. And, there's a familiar narrative in all these folks, you know, they didn't like school very much. School didn't like them very much. Now they're wildly successful doing something that no one ever anticipated you could earn a living doing. Um, and so we have, you know, we have teachers who come once and there's a teacher from Chicago who has come 10 times. Um, and there's no formal agenda other than, reacquainting yourself with your own internal power as a creative, competent, confident person who can make sense of navigating an uncertain future and can can sort of rekindle a love affair with, with learning and so that you can then hopefully take those experiences back to your classroom. I mean, I, I stole a little technique from my colleagues at Reggio Emilia when, whenever they're asked, you know, can you tell me about how I would apply this to my classroom? You know, I teach so-and-so subject, you know, and it's, oh, well, yeah, we're going to write that down and we'll get, we'll answer that question later. And then they never get to it. Um, because as, as you, as you mentioned, Adrian, your, your teachers came and they worked on nutty projects that had no direct applicability to the curriculum, but it transformed their ability as educators. And we hear that, we hear those stories over and over and over again. And CMK is frankly an act of lunacy and love. There's no reason for doing it. It makes no sense. When, when we end up, you know, at, at the chiropractor after moving 50 or 60 boxes and, you know, trying to worried about whether we're going to break even on the event and, you know, the, the 6 million pieces that we have to keep organized. It's essentially two of us who do the whole deal. Um, it's because of the, we run into teachers four or five years later who tell us that it, what it, what it meant to them. And, you know, the, the project ideas themselves are interesting because we really try to be non-coercive. You know, we try to create an environment where it's all about the learner and we mean it. And we don't just say that we, we really mean it. So when, when people say, express an idea that they have for a project, I would estimate 20% of the project ideas are are for making something that will torture children. Um, you know, I want to make something that will attach electrodes to their genitals, and if they go to the loo and they're gone for more than three minutes, they'll get a little zap, and their parents will be alerted, and it will be put in their permanent file, and the, you know, the authorities will be notified. Um, and, and I just sort of roll my eyes now and laugh at them and say, good, go do it. And the reason why I'm, I'm relaxed about that is because they learn so much about learning and they learn so much about technology and they learn so much about solving problems and, and, and a million other affective things as well as develop all sorts of skills in electronics and computer science and mathematics and engineering um, typically. Um, but also because they see that there's a lot of other stuff happening around them that's not in that category of project. And they, they recognize what other people learned and that it was at least as valuable, if not more so. And there's, there's a young educator, I would say she's mid-30s, who came to CMK about a half a dozen years ago. And her, she had one of those project ideas. And when she talks about CMK, she says, Gary hated me. 
I said, I didn't hate you. I, I hated your project idea, um, but I didn't hate you. And then she came back the next year, and I was kind of stunned. And she's come back four times. And this, this past summer, she stood up at the end and said, you know, I have to thank everyone here because this has changed my life and it's transformed my abilities and my view of myself and my, my skills as a teacher. And I was headed down an administrative track. I saw myself as becoming a school principal one day. And, and now I know I really belong in the classroom and I, I want to thank you for that. And, and I said to her, that's, that's really lovely and I appreciate it. And now I want to take you to lunch and convince you to become a school principal uh, because we need you in that role too. Um, you know, one, one, one other story that really sticks out was um, we, we discovered over time that there was a, an emotional arc that our participants went, went on, which I'm sure happens in classrooms with children, except I pay attention to these things. And, um, and how did we know there was an emotional arc? Because we'd have people crying or they would disappear the second morning. And, um, and we now say to folks, look, you have to trust the process. We've done this now 15 times. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to be exhausted. You might feel a little uncomfortable. Tomorrow morning, you may wonder why you're here. If you can make it to second day lunch, I assure you everything clicks into place and then it's smooth sailing to the finish line. And we had a teacher come up to us one year and she said, you know, the second morning, I felt stupid. I didn't like my teammates very much. And we don't assign teams. We don't assign projects. You know, it's all up to you. So if you don't like something, change it. But she felt powerless. And she said, I packed the car. I was ready to leave. And before I drove away, I went to get a cup of coffee. And just as I put the coffee to my lips, the solution to our bug came to me. And I threw the coffee in the bin and I ran back and my group said they missed me and they were worried about me. And I told them what I had figured out and it worked perfectly. And look at the project we created and all the things that we learned. And I said, that's fantastic. And this woman said to me, but that's not the lesson I'm leaving with. The lesson I'm taking back to school is when do my students get to get a cup of coffee? When we worry about time on task and eyes up front and we build these school buildings that have no windows and, you know, and, and we endlessly interrupt kids and that have the audacity to, to pathologize them and label them with all sorts of, you know, infirmities related to their attention deficits. Um, when did the kids get to get a cup of coffee? Because anyone who's ever been engaged in any kind of serious creative or intellectual pursuit knows as soon as you turn your back to the problem, the solution reveals itself. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, there's all this sort of tacit stuff, these tacit well, lessons that, that emerge um, in, through the experience of CMK. So I'm enormously proud of it. We're doing it again July 9th through 12th. Um, we're just confirming some of the, some of the guest speakers. Um, we have Stephen Wolfram coming. Stephen Wolfram is arguably the world's most consequential mathematician and scientist. He's responsible for most of the software and tools that are being used by mathematicians and scientists that underlie all the hoopla around AI, Mathematica, and Wolfram Language and Wolfram Alpha. Um, and he's been doing a lot of work with children and is deeply concerned about developing computational fluency um, because, you know, CMK has been associated with the maker movement. We predated the maker movement, and in a lot of ways, we've outlasted it. Um, and the maker movement gave us the ability to make things with bits and atoms. And schools really embraced the atoms. They really liked cardboard. But once again, they left the bits behind. And, and the computation is the, really, is, the soup, is the secret sauce that really supercharges what's possible, that creates a world of, of um, new careers and, and um, intellectual pathways that were unimaginable before. And, and then to sort of counterbalance that, I have a woman who's the world's leading authority probably on LC STEMA, which is the Venezuelan Youth Orchestra Program, because one of the powerful ideas of constructing modern knowledge is learning as a group not in a group and about um, how when you're engaged in creating something beautiful that's bigger than yourself, you're forming the basis for a democracy at an, in an age of rising authoritarianism and, um, you know, 
disinformation and fake news. I think it's a really good idea to sort of double down on democratic practices and to sort of put that in a in a more modern, different cultural context. We're pairing her with a woman named Melissa Walker, who runs a nonprofit in the New York City area called Jazz House Kids that takes the LC STEMA model essentially and creates informal learning environments for young people to be ja- become jazz musicians and has been wildly successful in that regard. Um, and then we'll have some, some surprises in the progressive category. I'm still working on that. The problem is all of my heroes are in their mid eighties and, and the, the bench, the bench is a lot. Uh, I, I, from my perspective, I think the bench is a lot weaker. Um, yeah, what are so you, I'm, what are you um, inspired by from the the emerging generation? You know, you, you mentioned um, you know Broadway stars and, and and digital composers. You've looked at the the technology impact on um, on careers and everything. But what is the what are the emerging inspirations? I guess that that you're seeing um, come from people who are defining their own categories, defining their own work within the um, the, the technological landscape or educational landscape. Well, you know, I, there's someone who's written a book and the, the, the book title escapes me about how critical crowdsourcing has been to identifying the terrorists who attacked the U S Capitol on January 6th, mm. that they've been invaluable to the FBI that people think, you know, the FBI have, have these magic powers of surveillance and they know everything and they're Santa Claus and they know when you're sleeping and know when you're awake. And it turns out, you know, a whole bunch of hobbyists have, have really assisted in, in a great law enforcement in a lot of, in really productive way, which I think is sort of interesting that, um, the idea that, you know, social media was going to deliver the sorts of outlandish promises that, that Adrian alluded to earlier, nearly as compelling as who knows what it'll lead to. It, there's probably going to be some interesting things there. Um, and that's sort of the, you know, if it's interesting, those those things will reveal themselves. And, and if those tools are any good, then they'll become indispensable indispensable parts of my life um you know i there's there's no shortage of creativity i i i i wanted to be a jazz musician until until my conspicuous lack of talent caught up with me and i was in new york city a little more than a week ago um to speak at a conference and in eight days i saw 13 sets of live jazz plus three concerts two two jazz one classical and a broadway show and the amount of talent that exists is extraordinary and young talent and enthusiasm and watching 87 year old Ron Carter look at his generation, younger colleagues with, with love and deep admiration. Um, and the, and them looking at him in exactly the same fashion. Um, really moves me and I think is, is what I aspire to in classrooms. I, I mentioned in an email that before, before we met, I, I saw a young woman named Cecile McLaren Salvant, who's a MacArthur genius and has won a bunch of Grammy awards. And she's a remarkable jazz singer. Um, and I saw her perform with a fantastic quartet in a in a hundred seat venue the village vanguard and it was it was one of these life-altering experiences and it was sunday night last set so it was the last set of a five-night run and half the crowd were world-class musicians and i i just wonder what the the analog for that is in schools Hmm. you know when when our biology teachers hanging out with each other to do biology or to be inspired by one another or show each other a trick or share something they just learned and they can't wait to, 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 to pass it along. Um, and how, how do we create that sort of collegial environment, not just between colleagues, but between kids and teachers? You know, I, I, I never worry about classroom management because I never walk into a classroom feeling like I need to manage it. You know, and agents probably 
seen me in schools. I, I you know, I, I got the great privilege of teaching in Reggio Emilia last fall. I'd been traveling to Reggio Emilia for 15 years at my own expense and was never allowed inside a school building when there were children present. And in the, and in my last trip, they handed me a class for half a day. And I was recently telling someone about that experience and they asked me what was a fairly banal question. They said, what year kids were they? You know, how old were the kids? And I said, that's a really excellent question. Uh, I don't know. Um, it didn't matter. And when I was in, um, when I was in Bulgaria last, about a year ago this time, we ran a workshop for teachers for two days. And then we ran the same workshop for kids for a day. And we invited the teachers to observe us working with kids. And we had kids, you know, two meters high working with kids, half a meter high. And if, if you read what the teachers shared about their experience, it was like they had seen a magic trick. You know, no one asked to go to the toilet. No, they worked through lunch. There were tiny little kids collaborating with giant kids. Year, and, we, and I thought maybe, maybe these year eight kids had to watch their little sister for the day. Or, and they said, no, no, we never met her until now. She's the brains of the operation. Um, or, you know, when I walk into Spensley Street at 630 on a Tuesday night and there's 55 prep to sixth grade kids and their parents, and I want to be able to say two things to the parents – that will contextualize the, the importance of the experience and not bore the kids and give them just enough for them to spend the next couple of hours doing something meaningful. Um, that's super fun and rewarding to me. And, and, I, and I think that th that's sort of an effort on my part to, dis to, to develop a teaching art. And, and I think that the the art of teaching has been neglected. I think it's been removed from teacher preparation. It's not a fault of teachers. It's just not part of their experience. Um, and, and we're making it worse by now calling everything the science of blah, blah, blah. I, I got stuck into someone on LinkedIn last night, some phonics fanatic, some member of the phonics Taliban from Australia who has an order of Australia for this nonsense. And – you know, talking about how deeply concerned they are about, you know, children's literacy levels dropping. And 10% um, of children a generation ago went to high school in Australia. Around, around, until about 1950, it was something like 10% of kids went beyond year eight. So this is just baloney. It's, it's, there's an illiteracy um, lobby. That's, that stands to profit from teaching reading for 12 years and constantly announcing that we're failing at it. Well, you've been at it for three decades. You failed. Leave me alone. You know, the, the thing that bothers me the most about these folks is what ungracious winners they are. They've had their boot on my neck for my entire career, and yet they whinge endlessly in the age and the New York Times about not, be, not being heard. When, when they've, they've completely vanquished any real opposition. And, and after, after this run, if you really want to apply science to their, to their propaganda, they're the ones who have failed. Not those of us who want to create text-rich environments where kids fall in love with reading and where learning is natural. And it's something that, that's that you're intrinsically motivated to do and that's a basic biological function of being a human. Mm. Gary, I think we could pick pick that up for like at least another hour because I have so many questions, um, you know, and so many rabbit holes. I think that we could go down there, and and, and I agree with you in terms of creating environments where kids uh, have a intrinsic love of what they do. Um, and and, <laughs> and uh, I've been following along your debate around the science of learning or the science of reading, and I, and I would love I'd love to pick that up again. But I think. In, in the interest of time, I think um, I, sure. I'd just like to come come back to a couple of uh, other questions. We, we had a previous guest, um, Gary, that said English is the hottest new programming language. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and what he was referring to was the fact that, you know, with things like ChatGPT, you can basically create some pseudocode or, or tell it what sort of program you want it to create and it will create something that's passable 
uh, for you. What, what are your thoughts on that? And in particular with your work, um, you know, do you, what, what, what do you feel about that? Well, all they've done is remove syntax. It's still programming. Mm. And, and the debugging is still going to be necessary. Mm. So I, I think it's glib. And it's, and, and, and it's not used as, as an opportunity to democratize programming. It's used as an excuse to not provide programming experiences for kids. Mm. Because after all, any monkey can do it because all you have to do is speak English, which isn't true. Someone made the software that makes that possible. And how dare you decide that which kids get to, to, be, to participate in that, that sector of the economy? Or the reason why, why I do it is because when I learned to program at 12 years old in a public year seven class in a middle school in Wayne, New Jersey, it was the first time in my life I felt smart. Because I didn't know what was impossible. I thought anything was possible. We formed a little community of practice where we challenged one another, pulled each other up by our bootstraps, and and you know taught one another what and shared what we had not, what we discovered and learned, um, and we got good at something. And I'll be damned if anyone is going to deprive a future generation of kids of those those high quality experiences. And it doesn't have to just be programming, um, but. If mathematics is a way of making sense of the world, computers are a way of making mathematics. And one of the things that Stephen Wolfram has been talking about is that for any discipline X, from archaeology or art to zoology and everything in between, there is now or soon will be a branch of that discipline that's computational X. And that not only represents the frontiers of that discipline, um, but it's also playful and it's, and it's beautiful and whimsical and interesting and deep. And, and it also represents the better paying versions of those careers. So why would we de deprive kids of those experiences? I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm reminded of one of my he boyhood heroes was Thomas Edison. And I've been to his laboratory outside New York city dozens of times. And there's a sign posted around Edison's lab in multiple locations, quoting Sir Joshua Reynolds, that says there's no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. <laughs> and, and, and you could just, you could just substitute thinking for programming. It's extraordinary to me how much effort, how much breath and time has been dedicated to depriving kids of programming experiences. Mm. And, and yet it's, simultaneously we create these standards documents, these meaningless lists of vocabulary that say all kids will spend 12 years memorizing 16 words. Um, when, when I'm, I'm not so sure that technology integration or curriculum integration of technology hasn't been a fool's errand. Maybe, and maybe this is something we could do at your school. Um, maybe it's worth saying, let's spend nine weeks like I did in Mr. Jones's class in year seven really learning how to do something to make the computer dance and sing for me. And then when a teacher introduces an idea or we have a, something we want to explore, we can use that as part of our arsenal of, sol of, of problem solving tools to hmm. construct meaning or to build something or to make something go or to solve a problem. Um, maybe it's not year seven anymore. Maybe we need to do it in year three. Hmm. Um, but why, why would it even occur to anyone to deprive kids of, of, of those experiences? And I, and I like, you know, I, I always joke, you know, we've made a billion and one arbitrary decisions about what every kid should learn. You know, show of hands if you were in a meeting where it was determined that every kid would write haiku. Um, but but we do these things for whatever heuristic purposes. Um, it would seem to be reasonable that kids could spend a few months of 12 years developing agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world. Can I just finish with yeah, that? I want, I want, and, and, and there's one other, there's one other technical detail that's, that's not, that's worth discussing in, in light of the English is the most powerful programming language. Um, right. But the environments weren't designed for children and they weren't designed to make connections between disciplines and they weren't designed to allow for multiple representations of knowledge. Environments like logo were, because they were created by really smart adults who loved kids and weren't afraid of schools and spent a lot of time creating environments that have withstood the test of time that 
that are just as hard and fun and magical and joyous and beautiful and compelling today as they were in 1960. My question, Gary, was somewhat selfish, but um, what, please, off the back, what what is creative intelligence to you? Um, it's selfish from my point of view because that's what I'm trying to to explore and uh, uncover within my own organization um, to define and explore and play with the idea of creative intelligence. In the past, as a consultant, you know, we've, we've codified creativity and innovation and, um, you know, <laughs> workshops and whatnot uh, around a structure that's meant to encourage creativity and, um, and marry it with some sort of insider intelligence. But I think what I've got from this discussion with you is that there's something so intrinsic to us as humans around being creative and being in that creative mindset and flow that, you know, that's what we need to reach uh, with all of this experiential uh, work that you're doing. I I think it's an instinct that I, that I have some experience and some expertise and maybe some confidence that, that I can, tackle something that I haven't confronted before um, and that I can set goals for sort of continuous improvement. Um, you know, the, I, I'm fascinated by, you know, the wanting to you know, spend committing a whole life to making a B flat sound better on the trumpet or hmm. the, you know, the things that people are, people who are great at what they do have that ability to identify the thing that, that, that helps them grow. Um, and they find that, they find that discipline that allows them to, 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 to that, uh, infinitely approaching, uh, approaching infinite, uh, that zone where there's any sort of improvement can only ever get them closer and closer, closer to the perfect, but they can never reach the perfect. But they're motivated by right, that. right, that, yeah, that, that, right, that, right, that, that, that perfection's perfection's not the goal, but, um, but, 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 yeah, the sort of aspiring to, towards it, um, mm. and, and constantly, constantly chasing it, and, um, again, I, you, you know, there, there's this new. Uh, the science of math, science of reading people. And, 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 you know, we should have this discussion because what's, what's amazing is the back the level of, of, of backlash. I mean, there are people getting death and rape threats for the most incremental suggestions of changing the curriculum. I mean, stuff that I would scoff at as being inconsequential. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, if you're going to risk your life for it, you might as well take a bigger swing. Um, and, and there's this, this new sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding these folks on social media who are taking things like project and saying, well, project-based learning doesn't work. The kids hate it. The parents do all the work. There's no explicit connections made to disciplines. And they'll use an example like a, you know, paper mache volcano or, and well, well, right. I disagree with all, I agree with them completely. It's a terrible project. It doesn't make any connections to powerful ideas. The kids will hate doing it. The parents will be over involved. I mean, all that is true, um, but that's not. But I think pro, the, a project approach is more like an approach to life that's about continuous improvement and about um, getting smarter and wiser and and building talent and social capital and finding joy and peace. And, um, you know, I, the older I get, the more I think that the questions that education is challenged most by have theological answers at, at their core. You know, it's a, a lot of times it's just a matter of, is it right or wrong? Is it good for children or not? So I think that, um, when, when when these you know when these ideas go to school, they often lose their power, and then they become caricatures of themselves. Um, but Papert said that the most powerful idea is the idea of powerful ideas. I think the most powerful aspect of project based learning is the the sort of disposition towards committing to a project. And you know, we one of the things 
I discovered at Constructing Modern Knowledge that I call riding up the down escalator. Um, you know, there's all this design thinking, you know, that comes out of the Stanford D school that has, you know, three steps or five steps or whatever. And it, it's great if you're designing a toothpaste tube for a Colgate. Um, it's not so good for being a physicist or a historian or playing the cello. It doesn't generalize very well. And yet, you know, when the only tool you have is a hammer, all the world looks like a nail and schools are making design thinking the standard for everything. Um, and what, what you find over and over again is people have some outlandish idea for a project at CMK. And then they go off to work on it. And they realize, yeah, that's beyond me. It's too challenging. We don't have the right stuff. So they modulate their expectations a little bit. They come down a step. And then they try that and they go, oh, but we don't have a laser cutter. Okay, so what can we do with cardboard? And they come down another step. And then something works and clicks. And they have some insight, some clarity that brings them closer to their goal. And then they go up again. And it, and it's this, this process that I – I describe it as you know riding up the down escalator. That it's often serendipitous. That maybe it takes a different path and goes in a different direction. Um, but but learning is natural and it's continuous, especially if you have that sort of disposition towards doing, as opposed to just sitting around and yakking about something, mm. or or believing that, or to believe that you know education would be a hundred percent better if people could differentiate between teaching and learning. If we could just make that distinction clear you know there's an awful lot of people who use the terms interchangeably and you know learning isn't the direct result of having been taught mm. learning is something the learner does mm. gary if if you were to to leave some parting words to to schools around their use of technology you know what what would you say to schools in general like what what would you be advocating right now in in 2023 well, it's remarkable that we're still arguing about whether kids should have comp access to computers. And I'm not going to use the word device because device is something you buy on the cheap for children you don't care about. No one walks to Norman or an Apple store and says to the clerk, I'd like a device, please. Kids, kids need a computer that's capable of doing all of the things that our, our adult reptilian brains think they should be doing with them. And then a whole lot of other stuff that we haven't even considered yet. And it, it makes me sad that we did this work in your neighborhood. Um, we changed the world in, in, in Australia. And, and yet you can campaign for office by saying you're going to install the same cell phone blocking technology used in the state prisons. And no one even ironically chuckles when you say that. Um, and um, so every kid needs a personal computer. And one of the things that we, we learned very early on at Kumbaba and ML. We knew we were onto something when the kids put stickers and wrote their names in glitter pen on the laptops because it meant they owned it. And when they owned the machine, they also owned the knowledge that was constructed within it. And, and we had a thousand laptops in MLC and the entire IT department was an, a, an elderly woman named Louise who when your laptop was broken, she said, oh, I'm sorry, honey, I'll call the vendor and they'll fix it. And that was the entire IT department. Everything else was up to the kids. Uh, if you wanted to know where your file was, it was on your machine. You were responsible for it. Um, so, so I think personal computing needs to be taken seriously again. That PC stood for personal, as in it's yours and no one else's. And I think there are ideas that spin off of that. I think, you know, you talk about kids building a 3D printer. I'd much rather them build a server. I'd much rather them have their own domain. I'd much yeah. rather, you know... <laughs> I got in trouble in, in year seven for publishing an underground school newspaper when it was hard to do because you had to actually have access to a printing press. Um, but now every kid has a printing press in their pocket, and yet they're helpless. You know, we talk about student voice, and if you talk about voice without action, it's just propaganda. Um, and I, I, the best advice, and, and I think we ought to be using computers as as intellectual laboratories of and vehicles for self-expression. We ought to be using them to make things and to make things go. That ought to be the primary emphasis. And that we ought to be able to differentiate between using a computer to support the system or clerical tasks and using it for educational ones. That, that technology can benefit either the system, the teacher, or the learner. The greatest return on investment is investing in the learner. And what made places like MLC extraordinary in the early days was all of the professional learning that was invested in was about helping teachers 
help learners do interesting things with the computers. If you wanted to learn how to write reports on the computer, they would pay for you to go to a class outside of school to do that. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't part of the professional development program. The professional development program was about making schools better places for children. Um, and, and the last piece of advice that I, that I would share, which is regardless of whether we're talking about technology or not, is less us, more them. Anytime you think you should intervene on behalf of some educational transaction, it's worth asking the question, is there less something is, is there is there less that I could do so that they can do more, that we can shift maximum agency to the learner? And and maybe as one last piece of advice, um, delight in the company of the nutty kids. Yeah. Gary, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to have you on the on the show. Um, we could have extended this for hours, and I think we will um, invite you back for any time. And we'll pick we'll pick up on some of those uh, um, perhaps uh, controversial topics, uh, which will be a fascinating conversation in itself. I appreciate. It. I look forward to seeing you. I hope we can work together soon. And that wraps up our insightful conversation with Dr. Gary Steger. As we navigate the evolving landscape of education and technology. It's voices like Dr. Steger's that remind us of the importance of keeping students at the heart of all of our discussions. Thank you, Gary, for sharing your wisdom with us. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on another episode of Large Learning.